Thank you. Okay, so uh, the uh, title of my talk is Effects and Resources, New Frontiers for Safe and Expressive Programming Languages. But you might ask, well, programming languages and research, uh, what, what are the connections? Is there anything to research in programming languages? Or do, is it, do we just have to essentially invent a language and write a compiler? So, in fact, yes, uh, there is a lot to research in programming languages. And the fundamental problem that we try to attack is complexity. Software, as we know, is complex since it models a complex world and also since it changes all the time. Uh, requirements change all the time, so we, we don't have decades to essentially uh, write the perfect software. Software needs to be malleable and that poses great problems for complexity and uh, the programming languages can help not solve the problem, the problem will always be there, but at least tame it to some degree. And we have in particular the community over the last decades has developed two uh, strong methods to help tame complexity. One is functional programming and the other is strong and static typing. So uh, I, I was told that the audience is quite heterogeneous here, so I will not assume too much. I'll tell you from the basics. Uh, let's start with functional programming. So what is functional programming? Functional programming focuses on transformations of immutable data instead of word-by-word -word mutations. If you think of a traditional program, then essentially you have variables and then you have recipes, you have loops and conditionals and you change the variables. So it all resembles a bit a, a von Neumann computer where each variable is a, is a word in the memory and you update them, you overwrite them and things like that. Um, and in fact, that is uh, good to understand the low-level mechanics, how things work, but it's really bad to abstract, to raise your level of abstractions. So functional programming is much better where you say you have immutable data, just like you have in mathematics. If you talk, let's say, about a polynomial, you don't have a theory in mathematics which says change the third coefficient of that polynomial and you will get the same polynomial. Oh no, you will get a different polynomial, it's a different value. Right? So functional programming is in that sense just like mathematics. The data are just values, they're immutable, and programming means we transform them. We create new data from other data. Why is that a promising and a successful paradigm? Well, first, like I said, it's very close to the underlying theories. Like if you, uh, let's say, linear algebra, you can translate that directly from a mathematics textbook. And also, we have found that it really helps to keep complexity in check by avoiding side channels. So a side channel is if a function computes something and then on the side it pokes memory and changes a little bit here and there, that's essentially an undocumented side effect which gives you this action at a distance which if you have many of these things, things become very complicated very quickly. So of course these are sort of values that have been uh, that existed for a very long time. So why has functional programming gained popularity in the last decade or so? Uh, and in fact, it has a lot to do with changing patterns of computations. So there's a dual challenge now. The first is concurrency and distribution. So our programs are not in a single computer anymore. They're all over the cloud or the internet and they all interact with each other. And the second is that our hardware, even our single computers, don't have a single processor thread anymore. They're all massively parallel to get more, more performance and we want to use this parallelism. But the problem is that if you combine parallel processing and mutable state, you get non-determinism. What do I mean by that? Well, if you see this program here, oops, sorry, let me go back. If you see the program here on the upper right, so you have two computations, they're prefixed with async, that means they should be able to, to be executed in parallel. So if a variable and one computation adds one to the variable and the other computation multiplies the variable by two. And in fact, that can give you a value, a final value of the variable, which can be 0, 1, or 2. You don't know what it is. It could be 0 in one run, and 2 in the next 100 runs, and 1 in the 101st run. Uh, 
You don't know what it is. And this sort of non-determinism is the nightmare of a software developer because it means that you can never trust your program. You can never test your programs enough. And in fact, you, if you ship your program on your client side, the computer might have slightly different timing characteristics and your program breaks on that side, whereas it worked perfectly on your side. That's, uh, that's the, the stuff nightmares are made from. Okay, so we can't roll back history. We can't say, let's do everything sequential, both for performance and because the cloud and the internet is a thing. So if you want to get back to deterministic processing, we need to avoid the mutable state because parallel processing in mutable state is this toxic recipe that gives us that. And avoid mutable state means programming functionally. So that's essentially the, the thing that is the gave functional programming a lot of impetus over the last decade uh, to say, well, we really should try that. But then, it, of course, it has lots of other methodological advantages. So we can visualize this a little bit. Uh, if you have um, program both in pair with an imperative language and with a functional language, you probably uh, got a feeling that they are fundamentally different. And if the, the way I like to uh, characterize it is that imperative programming is programming in time. You have a re recipe, you say, do first this, then that, then follow up with this thing. In functional programming, time is not, of, not, not relevant, really. It doesn't matter in what order you do these things. You, do, you can do them all in parallel, depending, provided you have the right dependencies, or you can do that in any order you like. So it's much more like programming in space. Think Lego bricks. You do a basis with the Lego bricks, and it doesn't matter in what, what, uh, what order you pose them. And then you pose other things on the Lego bricks, and several people can collaborate on Maybe, maybe uh, building a beautiful cathedral with Lego bricks or with real, real uh, building materials. So if we parallelize these things, then uh, working in space is no problem at all. We can parallelize very easily. But working in time is a big problem because now you have not only one time thread, you have multiple time threads and they interact. They write and read with two the same variables, which gives you this sort of non-determinism problem. Uh, so uh, that uh, the more threads you have, the, more, the harder things become. And then, of course, there are ways to tame that, to control that. There are uh, uh, monitors and semaphores and locks and all these things. But the problem with that approach is to do the right amount of these sort of mitigation strategies, you sort of have, first have to know where the problems are, where you could have these so-called race conditions, which cause the non-determinism. And that is sort of a very paranoid thinking. You have, to think, you have to think of what could the worst case be. And we humans, we are sort of more optimistic creatures by nature, most of us anyway. So we like, we like building things. We, we like much less so sort of think of all the last bit that could possibly go wrong. That's why also I think functional programming is in the end more enjoyable than imperative programming when it comes to parallelism. So, that was functional programming. What about the second recipe, strong types? So strong types give you essentially a, um, a, a, a uh, how, how do you say, a safety net uh, that uh, gives you a set of guardrails that prevent your program from doing bad things. So in a sense, you could say there are specifications, what your program does that you add to the program. And these specifications can make illegal program states unrepresentable. That means you can't even write a program that could go into an illegal state. Yet the type system, which is essentially a statically checked, uh, checked uh, system, will tell you that that program is illegal. Uh, you will get an error at compile time when you write your program. So with functional programming and strong types, we've found that we can write or refactor large bodies of code with very, very high confidence. And uh, there's a st strong connection here to mathematics, to mathematical logic, that is called the Curry-Howard isomorphism. So the two gentlemen you see here on the picture is Curry on the left and Howard on the right. Uh, the isomorphism says that propositions in mathematical logic, so things you want to prove, they can be captured as types of your programs, and the proofs of these propositions are then the programs themselves. So the, uh, the formula you see here has a program, which is a small t, and the t, large t is a type, and on the left-hand side you have an environment called gamma, which is the assumptions that you have to type-check the program. 
So these, this has very deep consequences. One consequence is we can use types to model the world because types are, can be propositions, things that we know about the world. And we can use programs to mechanize proofs. So uh, if, since a proof is just a program, we can compile the program and see whether it actually has this type. And we can use programs to specify and verify other programs. So that's some of the exciting parts of uh, research that, that are in the field. Now let me come to Scala specifically. So Scala combines functional with object-oriented programming. It, uh, the motto is it has functions for the logic and objects as modules. The history is what it was uh, it first developed at EPFL, uh, close to that building that you see with the stairs. Uh, the Scala logo is derived from these stairs. Uh, it was first really meant as a research language to prove a point, namely that we can combine functional and object-oriented and that the uh, combination is actually practical. Uh, but uh, then uh, the, we proved the point very, uh, very thoroughly uh, so, so far that adoption started six years later quite seriously with uh, Twitter was one of the first uh, big adopter of Scala. At the time, Twitter was a company with 25 engineers, uh, so it wasn't that big, uh, nowadays slightly less big uh, company that, that, we, that, that, we, that we know. Um, the success came very quickly, so what we then did was we took a step back and uh, thoroughly researched the type systematic foundations and a calculus called DOT. Uh, to actually say, well, we want to be really sure what we have put out there in the world. Uh, and that led then to a fundamental redesign of the language Scala 3 in 2020, which is, uh, compared to the first Scala, it's quite a bit simplified and more elegant and more expressive. So Scala was created to demonstrate that combinations of functional and object and programming could be practical. And by now, maybe that's quite common knowledge because most languages are object-oriented and functional at the same time. But in 2004, that was not at all uh, common knowledge. In fact, it was quite a sacrilege to, 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 to claim that because at, at that time, object-oriented programming was firmly in the domain of industry. Java, C++, Ruby are all object-oriented languages. And functional was really for the academics, for Haskell, OCaml, and Lisp. Nowadays, uh, even functional, even some of these languages have more industrial traction than they have now. And what's more, almost all the big languages that you program, modern Java, Swift, uh, Kotlin, uh, Rust, are essentially combinations of functional programming and most, uh, most often also object-oriented programming. OK, so what is Scala now that I've told so, so far? Let's see the code. So here you have a very simple Scala program. It's a class, rational, so it's a program for rational numbers. A rational number takes two arguments, the numerator and the denominator, which are these x and y parameters. Uh, the uh, the de uh, denominator must be greater than zero, which is this requires clause that you see here. And then we essentially define the numerator and nom uh, nom denominator by normalizing with the greatest common divisor, as we know from mathematics. And then we can write uh, operations plus and minus that give you new rational numbers with the formulas that you also know from mathematics. So plus is just the, essentially the, the usual combination of numerators and denominators of the two rational numbers. And then we also can override, that means redefine, the two-string method which prints rational numbers nicely with the two parts uh, and a, a, a slash between them. So what's important here is that this is functional and object-oriented at the same time. It's, it's functional because there's not a single variable that I change. I, I have immutable data, which is a rational number, and my program, uh, my methods like plus and uh, star, they produce other immutable data from that data. So it's clearly functional, but it's also object-oriented because you see here a class. A class is essentially a template for, to describe the structure of objects. That's a, that's a very object-oriented construct. OK, let's see some more code. Uh, collections are uh, always a favorite when you write programs with Scala. So, <clears throat> so here's a list, one, two, three. 
uh, I can filter the list. I give it a function which is a predicate which says keep only the elements of that list for which the predicate is true. Uh, in, this, in our case, the predicate says if I take the, the number modulo 2, then the result must be 0, which is another way to say that the number must be even. So that gives me, that doesn't modify the list, it gives me a new list, in this case a list consisting only of two, the only even number in here. Here we have another uh, uh, popular method, map. So map applies an operation to every element of my list and creates a new list. So map uh, xs.map plus one would give me the list two, three, four. Uh, here we have a, a slightly different variant, so I convert the list first to a set, and then I map to uh, give me all squares of these things. So uh, that gives me the set 149. That, just to show that I can use these things not just for lists, but also for many other uh, collection types like sets or maps or arrays or vectors and, or iterators and so on. Essentially, they all have the same operations. And here we have another one which is called flat map, which is an, a variant of map where the argument gives me another collection. In this case, it gives me a collection which is a string, uh, namely the string that consists of the digit that is my original digit, and then, uh, well, you see it, it gives me one ones and two twos and three threes, so essentially it uh, gives me as many characters as the, the digit value. And I can, flat map essentially takes all these three strings and concatenates them. So it's like map plus concatenate. Okay, so that's pe what, what people do every day and it, it comes very naturally when you do Scala and, or other, also other languages. Now what Scala also has, it has a convenient notation for these things which are called four expressions. So four expressions are sort of like four loops in many programming languages, but they are functional, that means they yield a new value that don't essentially mutate the, the global state. So what this for expression does is, or yields, I should say, is it lets x range from 1 to 2 and y from 0 to 1, and it gives you the pairs of all combinations of x's and y's. So you see, it gives you a vector of 1, 0, 1, 1, 2, 0, 2, 1. Uh, and these four expressions, they're actually not magic, they translate to what we've seen before, namely the maps and flat maps. At the bottom of the slide, you see uh, the formulation in terms of flat map and map. So one, two, three gives me, gives me, oh sorry, that would be, should be two, gives me a range, then I do a flat map on that, I pass a function to the flat map that takes the, uh, another range and maps it, uh, and finally I get this x, y. So you see that, well, some people prefer map and flat map because they're very used to it, but for the rest of us, I guess the four expressions is easier, easier to, to understand and reason about. So I've introduced four expressions because that's the, the next step then to say, well, these things actually work for things that are not collections, for other things. So here's something that, uh, that uh, we uh, can also do. Uh, now we have an, a for expression like the one we've seen before, but it works on futures, not on lists or vectors. So what a future is, it's an asynchronous, now we're getting to asynchronous and concurrent computation that gets run in parallel with our current code and at some point in the future delivers a, a result. And what the for expression does is essentially it launches the future, it launches the computation and says when the computation is done, take the value as x and continue. And then it launches the next future, takes the value as y and continues. So the for expressions are a nice way to essentially uh, orchestrate these asynchronous computations. And if you are in functional programming, then of course this is all uh, very well known to you uh, because you know that this thing is uh, a monad, which is the word uh, that functional programmers like to use. So roughly speaking, any type that has a map and a flat map is a monad. You can use it as a monad or almost. There, there's uh, certain conditions, but let's not go into them. So that's the essence of monad, a core abstraction of functional programming. Good, so we talked about functional programming, but Scala really is a unifier. It's object-oriented and functional. And it's a unifier in another axis as well. You've seen it has really lightweight syntax. 
I guess it sort of looks like a Python with types uh, to, 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 to some degree. Uh, and it's very suitable for small scripts, uh, single line programs in a REPL or notebooks or these sort of things. But at the same time, it actually scales. So the same things can, can do really, really big and important systems. So there are several code bases, over 10 million lines of code that are written 100% in Scala. Uh, and that is possible because it is both fast, it, uh, it runs uh, on the JVM and it's heavily optimized and it's safe because it has strong static typing. Good, but I haven't talked about objects so far yet. So uh, fun as functional programming gained in popularity, more, and pe more people said, well, why do we still bother with ob objects? The future is functional, Let's, uh, objects are legacy, we, we want none of that. Well, I think objects are still important, indeed very, very important, because objects are our module system. Module system is essentially the way uh, we define components and we put components together. And if your program is 10 million lines, then you will have a lot of components and it will be very hard to essentially put them together. So you need good abstractions for that. An object combines data and behavior, supports encapsulation, the behavior can be tailored to through parameters and overriding and be abstracted in interfaces. Short, it gives you a really powerful system of components and modules, and th that's essentially the role of an object. Good. Uh, that said, there are challenges. Uh, the challenges are mostly cultural and societal, uh, uh, because, in fact, uh, that's how many functional people see object-oriented programming. It's sort of the evil boss in the office with cubicles that gets in your way and tells you to, to do stupid stuff. Um, and uh, the aversion is mutual. So that's how many object-oriented people see functional programming as the crazy scientist that does, essentially goes off the rails and uh, uh, the, 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 the solutions are incomprehensible for everybody else and, and crazy. Okay, so how can we... Uh, combine these two things? Well, I think the outlook is that we really want to put the emphasis on what I call functional objects. So when we talk about object-oriented programming, because it was born in imperative programming, previously we, we, we characterized objects by having state, where state means mutable state, fields that we can change, identity, that means two pointers, we, we have really, we compare addresses to find whether objects are the same, and behavior. And now we sort of, when, if you see rational, we, we see we want to eliminate the immutable state. We want to have structural equality. So two rational numbers are the same if they have the same numerator and denominator, not that they point by accident to the same region in memory. And we want to concentrate only on the functionality. And the problem is that uh, this new version of objects is not that popular yet. So we, if people talk about objects, they think the old one with the state, which is really sometimes very hard to control, whereas this new one, I believe, is very powerful and nice. So let's see how that works in the real world. So one big real world usage is risk modeling. Uh, that's typically done by large investment banks such as Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. They have very elaborate systems that model the world. Uh, and essentially every event that happens in the world is fed into this system in real time as it happens. And what the system does is essentially a very complex system that then does a lot of computations, what if, and at the end, uh, what drops out is a recommendation on a trader's desk to buy or sell at this and this price. So now you can imagine that if you have a better system than the competition, then you have a tangible advantage in your trading, uh, and that means you will make more money than the competition. So these things are sort of the crown jewels of these, these big banks. And Scala is the language of choice for many of these applications. For instance, uh, Op uh, Morgan Stanley has a system called Optimus Prime, which does precisely that. And that's one of the code bases. That's over 10 million lines of code and over 500 uh, very qualified programmers that, that work on that system. Other adoption was, well, we talked about Twitter. Twitter uh, is, what, what, what is, is also a huge Scala code base. Many, many Scala engineers, uh, at some point over a thousand. I think by now it's probably less uh, with, with all the uh, waves uh, p uh, people that Twitter had let go. 
But another site is if you took a course on Coursera, say Coursera for uh, all the academic courses, so that's a site that's written in Scala. Or if you uh, uh, wanted to learn a, a new language with Duolingo, that's another site written in Scala. So these things are all Scala programs. Or maybe you want to get uh, some, some watch a film on Netflix or Disney Plus, or listen to some music on Spotify. There's a lot of Scala in all these things. So Disney streaming is Scala. Uh, Netflix recommender systems is Scala based. A lot of uh, Spotify recommender system and streaming is also Scala based. And then there's big data where the uh, standard framework, the biggest, most popular framework is Spark. And that's also a, 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 a Scala code base. So that was done by a bunch of graduate students in Berkeley uh, 10 years back. And they picked Scala because, well, essentially it fit their requirements. And then it grew into a very big company. Databricks is valued now at $20, $20 billion or something like that. So in aggregate, we have, I would guess, uh, about half a million developers that are using Scala today. And uh, we have uh, another number, which is maybe more precise, is our um, uh, massive open online courses on Coursera, which uh, are the ones you see here on the right. They got so far over 800,000 uh, registrations. So that's people who at least, uh, but of course, there are four courses. So uh, uh, some, some people take more than one course, uh, but you, it, it gives you, lets you, it, extrapolate a, a little bit in how many people at least got some decent exposure to Scala. Okay, but I was talking about new frontiers. So, so that's all sort of stuff we did so far. So what are the new frontiers? So for me, the one that I find uh, the one where we can make a real difference is uh, that to push the envelope what we can do with types. So types so far have been very successful, but there are two areas where the ergonomics are not good yet. Uh, one is uh, safe resource usage. So for instance, you want to allocate of things that are stack allocated, exist only for a certain time, or you can use it only once, or these sort of things. And the other is safe effects. I was saying functional programming, they shouldn't have side effects. Uh, that's true uh, in the ideal case, but a lot of programs really need to have at least some side effects where the answer is, well, first you should keep, keep them only for the essentials, and then we really want to be able to type check these effects as well. There are solutions in Scala and also in other functional languages such as Haskell. Uh, they are called monadic effect frameworks. So they use this, basically in Scala, they use the four expressions that I've shown you to do not just futures, but essentially all sorts of effects. Uh, not future is an effect where you say, it's essentially a time effect that things happen later, but they combine other things in these futures. Uh, there are frameworks that are, one is called Zio of the popular ones, the other is called Cat's effect. They do provide solutions, but these solutions tend to be very challenging, in particular for newcomers. So newcomers see the code base and say, whoa, this is really complicated. And I can't disagree with that. And I, this is not just on the surface. So we can, it's not just that we need to essentially smooth some syntactic part things to make it nicer. Uh, the root of the problem here is really the fact that since these things are monad-based and monads, they don't compose very well. We can't really plug them together very well. They're quite, quite awkward to do that. And that leads to the complexity. So we have this complexity through effect typing that we say monadic effect typing is a large source of complexity because fine-grained effects need very complicated design patterns. So what can we do? Well, we can essentially do what most of the industry does now and just says, don't bother with typing these things. So don't do uh, uh, effect typing, don't check your exceptions, uh, no tracking of side effects, uh, maybe have unsafe allocation patterns or use of uh, garbage collection everywhere. So that's what essentially, currently people are, are okay with this, but people always want to push further. They want to have safer programs. So uh, there's a, 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 frag, a part of the community that is not happy with this state of effect. So the other solution would be to say coarser info, so don't track individual effects, just say it's pure, which means it's purely functional, uh, no side effects, or it's impure, and then it can have arbitrary side effects. That's, for instance, what Zio does, and that's sort of more manageable, uh, but um, uh, it's, still, it's still clunky, I think. Or third, research better effect systems, and that's what we're going to do. So uh, there actually have been 
hundreds of papers about effects over the last uh, 30 years. But the, the other part is that except for these monadic things, which I, uh, I find actually quite clunky, there's simply no larger adoption yet of these things. And the, the reason is because essentially all these effect systems, Monad included, are just not ergonomic enough. They're too difficult to use for the benefits they provide. So the core insights uh, behind our research is that we can express resources and effects as what I call capabilities. And we can, uh, we, we should then uh, track in types which capability a computation has access to, or we say which capabilities it retains. Okay, so let me explain that in a little bit more detail. So resources, what are resources? So re for me, a resource is a value that's available only with certain restrictions. Restriction could be lifetime, so, so you can get access only up to a certain point and then you can't get it anymore. Or sharing, that means only one uh, computation, one thread uh, computation can access this thing at a time. Or quantity, that you say, well, maybe there can be only one instance of this and I can't duplicate it. So examples are variables, all your variables in memory, regions, uh, file handles, uh, channels, uh, database, network connections, all these things are resources. I can't arbitrarily copy them, I can't share them arbitrarily, bad things happen, for instance, if I want to write to a file after I have closed the file. So in that sense, a, re a file is not, is not a value where I can use all the operations at any time, there, there are restrictions. So what are effects then? Well, effects are all aspects of the computation other than the shapes of inputs and outputs that we want to track in types. So in functional programming, we have function types. We say they get the parameters of these types and the result is of that type. That's a shape of input and output. Uh, but we, we want to say, yes, in, ad in addition, the function might throw an exception or it might have a side effect uh, or it might write to a file. So we want to track these things as well. So examples of effects are updating variables, throwing exceptions, doing I.O., suspending a computation, like in an async computation, it would also count as an effect. So if we look at programming languages and programming, then uh, we see this, uh, this uh, difference between pure functional and resources and effects uh, in, in actual programming languages and in programming concepts. So at the high level, we have the theory of functional programming, which is called the lambda calculus, which was originally a, a, a foundations of logics and mathematics. And there are no resources and there are no effects. Uh, every value that I have, I can use without restrictions as often as I want, as long as I want. And uh, of course, I, all I can express are pure functions, no side effects allowed. But on the computers, actual computers that run these programs, I, essentially everything is a resource, everything is finite in an actual computer, and everything is an effect. All, all a computer can do is change a bit, little bit of memory, right? Or send a signal on a channel, on an output channel or to the screen. Everything is an effect down here. But in our computational models, uh, both of these things are absent. So that's reflected in programming languages. There are low-level languages like C and C++ that are very close to the hardware and where essentially everything is a resource. Even memory I have to manage, I have to do malloc and free and these sort of things. And uh, the, everything is a statement which has a side effect that in the end changes some parts of the state. And then I have languages that follow much more the functional model. So the, probably the, the purest mainstream functional language is Haskell. Uh, then there are others which are combine functions and objects and combine functions and variables. So that let you write effects, but that put the emphasis on functional programming. Those would be Scala or OCaml or Lisp or some others. And then there's sort of mainstream languages in between that can, where you can do functional programming and you can do imperative programming. So some of them are Java or Swift or go. So that's sort of the, the landscape of programming languages. But there's another dimension that I want to mention here, and that's if we have effects and resources, to what degree can we compile, track them at compile time? 
And the answer is uh, not much. Uh, so most of these languages are very much on the left axis here. Uh, that is, say, typically we don't we don't do that. Java is a little bit on the right because Java has so-called checked exceptions. So at least one part, of one, one kind of effect I can match, uh, manage in Java. But on the other hand, a covered is checked exceptions are actually not very popular in Java. People, most people find them a pain to work with. So that's sort of a warning sign that it's actually not easy to do these things right. So there's one exception, and that's Rust. So Rust is a language that has very fine-grained checking of memory effects, um, and it, it, it's, 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 it's uh, quite, quite goes much, much further than the other languages out here. But Rust fundamentally is still an imperative language, so essentially you can't, you can't really do a lot of the functional programming patterns, mostly because Rust doesn't have a garbage collector, so essentially you, it forces you to have lots of resources and effects that you have to manage in a very fine-grained way. Now you could say, okay, in the rest of the quadrangle, so can we find a high-level language that has fine-grained ch checking of effects? So fewer effects and resources because we are more functional, but those that we have, we want to check uh, in the type system. So can we do that? And the, uh, the answer is, well, many people have tried. Some, some of the uh, uh, projects uh, that have been done in this space, uh, so they, all, they were all big research projects with outcomes, but uh, I, one, one sees that nothing of that really has made its way to actual programming practice in, with languages that have any kind of traction. So that's what we try to change uh, with this project, which is called Caprese. Caprese is a, a mozzarella salad, but it's also a shorthand for capabilities for resources and effects. Now, uh, to go from C, C++ to Rust required a substantial investment, first from Mozilla, then many companies, Amazon, Microsoft, and there was an ERC project about this. Uh, to, for Capriz, since we, the, we, we are higher level, uh, we don't have that much funds, but we do have a large project uh, uh, that's uh, essentially of the size of an ERC advanced project uh, that we essentially is starting now and running for the next five years. So I'm gonna, I want to tell you a little bit what we are doing in this project and why it's a, a problem worth solving. So for effects, for effects, we have this problem which is called the effect polymorphism problem. So effects are a curious thing compared to other types because unlike other types, effects are transitive. What do I mean by that? So here on the left you have a bunch of functions and the arrows means calls. So the function one calls function two and that calls uh, at, with some chain uh, function n and then function n might have some effects like IO, throw an exception, assign to a variable or wait for uh, an event that would be a suspend effect. But the point is that because function one calls function n and it has these effects, the function one has the same effects indirectly because it calls a function that does IO, function one does IO. And this transitiveness is not in other types. And that means that the, so it means that the effects of F1 include the effects of the functions it calls transitively. And then the problem is that our call graphs I give, gave you a single line, but in reality, they are highly dynamic. They, 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 they depend on input conditions and things like that. So there's not, it's not a single graph like that. So if your call graph is dynamic and your effects are transitive, how do you describe what possible effects a function F1 could have? There are ways to do this, but none of them is ergonomically, notationally very pleasant. So that's what's called the effect polymorphism problem. The effect polymorphism problem, basically, polymorphism means having many forms. So it's, it means function F1 could have many, many effects. It really depends on the functions it calls. And what are these effects? How can we specify them? Okay, so that's a long-standing problem in effect, so very, very well-known problem. And it turns out that we can actually solve this problem with capabilities. So um, the, the first observation is that we can model an effect with a capability. Uh, let's see what I mean by that. So the first line that you see here, we see a function definition, function f, def f, and uh, after the colon, there comes the type of the function, 
which is t in here, and then we say throws e. So that means the function has a return type t, and it might also throw an exception e. So e is clearly an effect. We have a declaration that the function could throw an exception, so that's an effect. That if it's an effect system that we have here. Uh, the other way we might express that is uh, at the bottom line here, that we say we have this function, and it takes another parameter of type can throw e. I just made up the types, so we can define those types any way you do. So can can throw e means I get a capability as an argument to the function which says, so I give you now, by means of this capability, the permission to throw t. And then the, to throw an e, sorry. And then the fun function's return type is just t. So that's, in a sense, equivalent. I, in the first case, I say, hey, I can throw a t. And in the second case, I say, I need the capability to throw a t. Well, for what? Obviously, to throw a t, right? To throw an e. Yeah. Sorry. So, so the two are essentially just two ways to express the same thing. OK, so if there are two ways to express the same thing, how can changing the viewpoint from effects to capabilities make a difference? Well, let's have a look. So here we have the type of our map function that you saw earlier. So this is this map function uh, on, let's say, uh, lists of type A. So what the map function says is uh, it, it takes a function from the type of the elements of lists A to a new type B. It gives you a list of B, right? So in our case, the first case where we said map plus one, the A would be int, B would be int, and would just go from int to int, but the functions can also uh, map between different types. OK, so that, of course, is the map in the functional setting. We haven't talked about effects yet. What do we need to do when we talk about effects? Well, in the traditional way to, to treat effects, we would need to do something like this. We would need to say we need a new type uh, parameter called e, which represents the effect. And then the, the argument to map is a function that ma now maps a to b. And it has this effect E. We don't know what this effect will be, but we just have to cater for it. And then the result of the map is a list of B. And that's the transitivity. It has the same effect E. It has the same effect as the function it calls. OK, so this might look not so bad, but in practice, it, it, it really is. So the problem is that in practice, map is a typical case for almost every function. In an object-oriented program, when I call a, a method of another object, I don't know what's behind that method. It's, it is called dynamic dispatch or virtual calls. So since I don't know what, what type is behind that method, I don't know what effects this method could have. So I have to play the same trick to say, well, yeah, let's uh, invent a type variable for the effects of these methods and say, our caller has the same effect. So it would mean to, to have these effect variables everywhere in our programs, and it would make the notation very, very clunky. So that's why this really hasn't caught on. So with capabilities, what we have is this. Well, if you look at this, this is exactly the type we started with. What goes on here? How can we suddenly say, by shifting to capabilities, we can keep our nice type of map and nothing changes? Well, let's analyze it. So the type A, double arrow B, is now the type of impure functions. So these are functions that can have side effects. And they can have side effects because they can capture a capability as a free variable. We'll, we'll see what that means in, in, in code later on. Uh, if you know the, the lingo, essentially these Function parameters are called closures, and they're called closures because they close over. That means they can reference variables on the site. And these variables can be capabilities. So that's why it works, uh, because uh, uh, essentially we pass a function. The function has already all the capabilities it needs to do an effect. And uh, that's, uh, that, therefore, we can keep the same type. Now, of course, we would like also a different type that says, well, I want a pure function, a function that cannot have retain any capabilities to do things. It should be a pure function in the mathematical sense. So we have a new type for that, which is a single arrow. A single arrow B stands for pure functions. OK. Now, this is almost too good to be true, right? We've solved the effect polymorphism problem by going to capabilities. Is there no catch? Well, there is a catch. Of course, there always is. So um, the catch is that capabilities that, in this sense, really are resources. 
So let me, let me uh, make clear what that means in a, a slightly larger program. So here we have a program that uses exceptions. Um, it invents an exception type called too large. That's the first class here. Class too large extends exceptions. And then it has a function that can throw a too large. So we have the, 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 the effect paradigm. And it throws too large when, well, when the number is too large. And otherwise, it, it gives you the square of the number. And then we have, as a main program, a list of ints. And we have a, a try catch, which essentially is, is a thing that is, can, can throw and, and handle an exception. So in the try, we say, let's try xs.mapf. And if we get the too large exception, then return nil, which is the empty list. So that's what this program does. So um, the, uh, if we go to capabilities, we would have uh, this uh, program here. So you've seen the, 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 the similarity between effects and capabilities. So we say, well, instead of declaring an effect, I take a capability that it, I can throw too large, and that capability gets generated in the try. So in the try, this using new can throw too large is when I, when I pass the capability. Um, and uh, the, uh, why can I generate that capability? Well, because the try catches too large. So I can say the try. If I catch an exception, I can give the capability to throw that exception to the body, because it will be caught, right? So we are safe. So that's essentially why it works. If you wondered what these using things are and why it's not a normal parameter, using things are so-called implicit parameters. So in practice, you will see none of that. It's all automatic. It's all behind the scenes. Uh, and that's why, why the, the U is essentially you, you can write your program in essentially the same way as you, as you have here and not worry about these additional capabilities that gets passed. OK, so far so good. So we have, a, have seen a case in action uh, where capabilities got generated and used in this thing, and everything is safe. But now let's do a slightly different version of this program. So my program now is, I say, instead of mapping f over a list, I map f over an iterator over a list. An iterator is a lazy thing that essentially just gives me the capability to, or gives me the, a way to traverse the list later at any point I choose, but not, not right now. So xs.iteratorMapF gives me back another iterator that can traverse these lists. And the problem is that uh, the function f will be applied uh, when I call the next element of the iterator. So I say it, it.next means, okay, get me the next element of the iterator. Then the iterator will say, okay, it's a ma f mapped over this list. So let me essentially apply f to the first element of the list. And if that's too large, then that f will throw an exception, right? Only then it's too late. I'm out, I'm out of the try. There's no, nothing that catches my exception anymore. So we need to rule out a program like this statically. How can we do that? Well, the core idea is that we need to track in a type which capabilities can be captured by values of this type. That's a new way, the new thing that we have to keep track on. OK, let me do a simpler example to, to, to get this more uh, crisp and not use exception or things like that. So here we have a typical try with resources pattern in, in Scala. Uh, uh, that there's, a, there's a convenience function called using log file. And it says, I need an operation that uh, gets a file output stream, something it can write to. And that gives me some type t back. And what the uh, convenience method does is it creates a log file. That's this log file, the file out, output stream with name log. It runs the operation with its log file as argument, so that will write to the log file. It closes the log file, so that will flush it to memory, to, 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 to disk, uh, and it will return the result of the program. So that way I can add logging to any program. That's, that's quite useful. But I have the same problem, in a sense, as before, because uh, the problem is that the operation op might return a function that accesses log file after it is closed somehow with the same iterator trick. And that, of course, would lead then to a runtime crash because I can't write to a function after it is closed. So the, the 
the, the, the idea to, to, to handle this is that we can make file output string a capability like this. So what the only thing that, that's changed here is this star instead of file output string. That's our current notation for making a thing a capability. And that would rule out the problematic use case that you see here, where you have a, a xs.iterator map, and then we write to it. So that was the same thing as a delayed write, so we can't do that. And here at the bottom, you see the error message that you would currently get with our system. It's not great, but uh, it's uh, part of the project that we want to do is to actually improve these error messages. So that's, that's part of the research, what we can do there. OK. Um, on the other hand, uh, so our system should rule that out, and it does rule it out. On the other hand, this usage here sh is perfectly okay, and it should be accepted. So here we just take uh, the F, uh, we, we, we just run uh, 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 the operation on a list directly, and uh, when we are done with, uh, with, with the operation, then nothing remains. We, we don't access the file anymore. So this should be okay. And to achieve this difference in typing, turns out that we'll need a few annotations on iterator, but none on lists. OK, so what's the system then that achieves this? So here are the basics of the system. The uh, idea is that we introduce this idea of a capturing type and a capability, and the two hang uh, essentially depend on each other recursively, mutually. So a capturing type is uh, written of the form that you see here. So it has a set of capabilities and a type. So it consists of a type and a capture set of capabilities. And what the capture set does is uh, it says values of the type can reference these capabilities. So what is a capability then? Well, a capability is just a reference to a parameter, typically in your program, or to a local variable in your program. and uh, then you say, well, any reference to a variable or parameter? No, uh, just the, those that have a non-empty capture set themselves. So it's recursive. So you say something is a capability because it has a capture set. And uh, a capture set consists of further capabilities and a type. So that means that every capability gets its authority from some other more sweeping capability which it captures. And that means also that there must exist a root capability from which ultimately all others are derived, because otherwise it would never end. Every capability would need another more powerful capability to, to derive its authority. So what this is actually, uh, interestingly enough, it's a type systematic description of the familiar and quite popular object capability model. So that model is very old, uh, exists for 30, 40 years. It's used a lot in security operating systems, things like that. But so far, it was all dynamically typed. So this is the first, essentially, static typing of these things. OK, I'm going to go. Uh, uh, the, the next part is a bit theoretical. I'm just give you a very uh, quick overview of what this system would look like. So essentially, the way we do these things, uh, in, we formalize these things in programming languages, is we invent a mini language that expresses these things precisely, and otherwise that builds on essentially what is our standard uh, substrate for research, which is the lambda calculus, the, the essentially the, uh, the foundation of functional programming. So uh, it, you see a lambda here, so that's a function uh, value, uh, and um, X, Y is application. So then you say you have types, which are uh, the things you, that you see here. We have function types, and we have a so-called top type. Uh, and both of these things are called shape types. And then a type is a shape type, so a shape plus possibly a capture set. And a capture set is just a set of references to variables. And variables are parameters of functions. So that's essentially our, uh, the syntax that we, we work with. Uh, what we need then is uh, the, uh, we introduce a so-called subtyping and subcapturing relation on that syntax. Uh, so a subcapturing relation puts two capture sets in relation with each other. Uh, the first observation is that smaller capture sets lead to subtypes, types that are more specific, and pure types with empty capture sets are subtypes of capturing types. 
And then we have the sub-capturing relation, which says it's essentially subset plus this rule here, which is a inference rule that you typically have in type systems, where you say that uh, a, uh, if a variable is declared to with a, a type S, a shape type S, and a capture set C, then the capture set that consists just of this variable subcaptures is more specific than the capture set C with which the variable is declared. So what, this is a very important rule because it says that derived capabilities, that's the X in this case, are more specific than original ones. So the C is the capabilities with which the X is declared. And then I can say, well, I pa can pass you the C, just the X and not the other capabilities, and I get something more specific in that thing. Okay, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to skip uh, some slides. So I'll just give you a rough outline of what it looks like. So um, what you then set up is a simple type system. I think the important part here is the part in gray underlined because all the rest is completely standard. It's standard, uh, it's standard essentially, the way you would set up a type system for simply type lambda calculus. What you see here is basically what I want to drive home. The points in gray are pretty small. So they are fairly small changes that we need to do to a standard model to get, to get at where we are. And, uh, yeah, uh, so here we have the rule for capture refinement that we say, well, if we just refer X, then X is also our capture set. Uh, the application is so-called dependent, so it's a, it's a variable dependent type system. And uh, the let rule has, uh, yeah, well, well, let's just skip through that. Um, so the question then is, if you have a theory like that, you need to implement it, right? Otherwise, it's just on paper. So. Uh, we need a part of the compiler that does this capture checking, which is called the capture checker. So the idea of the capture checker is that we will first infer all the types as we did before, and then we will essentially add to each inferred types a capture set variable, which we essentially don't know yet what it will be. Then we recheck the program with the usual typing rules, and we generate constraints on these capture sets as we do that. We solve the constraints incrementally using propagation, and then we infer certain uh, box and unbox operations uh, similar to implicit conversions. So in practice, that turns out that we can check these things, and the annotation overhead is quite reasonable. So to, to figure that out, we uh, ported uh, one of the sort of collection straw man, so not the full standard library, but essentially a condensate of the library to capture checking. Uh, libraries that used uh, lists and iterators and uh, types that you've seen. And we said, well, what does it look like? Uh, what, what would change to add essentially capture, check, capturing types to these uh, uh, library abstractions? And it turns out almost nothing. So <clears throat> for list, for instance, essentially nothing changes. You see at the bottom two stars, which means that uh, the flat map and concat operation, they can essentially take uh, an argument that can itself have a side effect, uh, and we're happy with that, uh, which essentially makes them more powerful than they, than they would otherwise be. But otherwise, the type is exactly what it was before. No change is necessary. And for iterator, we do have changes in the transformer methods of iterators. So for instance, we saw for iterator for the map, if we do the map delayed, we have to track that. And indeed, you see that here with the underlined yellow thing, that we say the map method returns an iterator, and it references both the current iterator, that's the this and the capture set, and it also references the method f. So if the method f has an effect, the same effect will be, uh, will be retained by the iterator in the result. And the same thing happens for flat map and plus plus. But the, the point is that these things are actually quite rare because most collections are strict. And so for strict collections, nothing changes. And some of the things like iterators are delayed. Uh, and, and for them, I have capture sets. But these capture sets are also very natural. That's what you would expect, let us say. I return an iterator. And yes, this iterator will keep a link to the original iterator and the function. So the point of departure then for our work 
is uh, what we call the capture calculus. You see the whole thing on the right. And again, I want to drive home how small it is. Uh, this is actually pretty small as, as things go, uh, that it actually can fit even with small fonts on a, on a slide. Uh, we have a capture checker for a larger language subset. And uh, so far, this is all very promising in the small, but the question is, can we scale it up? And uh, uh, for that, we have this Caprice project, which is essentially this large five-year project, uh, uh, four different areas, uh, four to six PhD students, two research engineers, one postdoc, uh, runs for four, five years starting now. And I should say that uh, Insight has a PhD program, so if you're interested in the project, there's still places available, applications are still possible uh, for both PhD student and postdoc positions. So what are we going to do in the project? So four areas. In the four, first area, we have to, we, we are, the, the, the first area is the core, where essentially we want to work on these capture checking foundations on the type system, find connections to operational semantics, to program logics. We want to extend the theory that I've shown you so far to other language constructs that are important in practice, in particular to the objects and we want to investigate inference algorithms. So how can we infer types for these things? Uh, the second one is concrete effect domains. So we want to make capture checking if expressive enough to express in particular safe memory systems. That's what Rust does and concurrent runtimes. Um, infrastructure means uh, we have to work on the language, on the compiler, capture checking algorithms, on the error diagnostics, and we have to find methods and tools to migrate existing code, because of course we, can, we don't start at zero. There are so many Scala, Scala programs out there, and we want to be able to migrate them to the new system in a way that, that is manageable. And finally, there are applications, so there are many possible applications. The one we want to look at is security, language-based security, Efficient computing, so uh, essentially large-scale, uh, uh, safe, uh, safe concurrent computing, distributed systems, and uh, formal methods. So the outlook uh, of the thing, if we are successful, which is not clear, it's a research project, the work, I believe, will solve several long-standing problems in programming. I mentioned effect polymorphism, get, getting the flexibility without the overhead, making, uh, the, the second one was mixing synchronous and asynchronous code. That's currently called the what color is your function problem, uh, which is essentially just the effect polymorphism in another domain. Uh, how to combine manual memory allocation and garbage collection is another problem that I believe can be solved with, by this work. And uh, the, the fourth one is what's called fearless concurrency. That means we don't want to have data races or other hazards that I showed you initially. So essentially we want to bring the same safety we have from pure functional programming to systems that also have concurrent computations and side effects. So I believe if, we, if, if that comes out, as I hope, that that will lead to exciting new ways to model functional and two and imperative programming as two ends of a spectrum. So no more uh, either or. So it's a, essentially you can be uh, gradually imperative if you need for efficiency or for your semantics of your program, but you can get the same safety, uh, safety guarantees that you get for pure functional programming. Thank you.